welcome to the CEC report. It's January 25th. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined by CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC report, time to enact the Commonwealth National Credit Bank Bill. Historical background, Treasurer Ted Theodore's credit solution in the Great Depression. And finally, Australia's concern about war with China will be the cause of it. So first, time to enact the Commonwealth National Credit Bank Bill. Craig, we're in a new year and it's time to really get serious about economic solutions. Um, just to, before we talk about our bill for a bank, uh, I want to give the audience a brief update on the Glass-Steagall issue because we have championed Glass-Steagall for four years and it's the most common theme probably in the CEC report. Just in, as of the the new year, which is still brand new really, Glass-Steagall, the, the debate over Glass-Steagall has erupted seemingly everywhere in the world. Just for the benefit of new viewers, Robbie, the, when we talk about Glass-Steagall, we're talking about the law, the ex exact same law that Franklin Roosevelt brought in in 1933 that separated apart the, the banks at that point to make the commercial banking side separate to the trading bank. So you didn't have the huge amount of uh, he broke apart the potential for huge speculation using depositors' funds. And that is what we're proposing today, the exact same legislation. Yeah, so the banks that serviced the daily lives of ordinary people for your deposits and you, business your commercial accounts, banking system, they, were, they were protected Yes, and they were, weren't having anything to do with the, the banks like um, in Australia, Macquarie Bank or whatever, that, that go around and... And basically uh, gamble. It was a novel idea, Robbie, that banks are banks. They're not insurance houses. Right. They're not stockbroking houses. They're not banks. They're not merchant banks. They're, they're actual banks that service the economy. Now, just, and just on that, in terms of the American law, Craig, I'll explain one thing because so, it'll come up again in a second. Um, the banks that uh, looked after people's deposits, America had what they called the, or still do, have the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and that, that insured those deposits but the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation did not insure the other banks, right? And that was also part of the separation. So if the banks that held people's deposits got in trouble, they were protected and bailed out. If the other ones got in trouble, that the rich people put their money in to gamble with, they didn't get bailed out. Now that was repealed in 1999, and of course, when the crisis erupted in 2007, the bank said, oh, you've got to bail us out because if we go down, we take people's deposits down with us. And that was called too big to fail. Yeah. And so that's, that's created this debate and to bring back Glass-Steagall. That's where you've had $21 trillion of taxpayers' money poured into the banking system in the US yeah. alone to try and prop it up. So just this year, I'll just go through some of them. In London, Liam Halligan, who's a regular writer in The Telegraph, has been jumping up and down about Glass-Steagall, and he's also uh, part of a uh, financial institution in London. Probably the most significant one so far this year is the former... J.P. Morgan Chase, National Sales Manager for Securitized Products. So this is in America, and his name's Larry Doyle. And securitized products are the very mortgage-backed securities that caused the um, crisis uh, in 2007, 2008. He came out um, last week calling for Glass-Steagall. And a prominent Australian economist, John Quiggan, a dear old, I won't call him friend, but you know, acquaintance of the CEC, um, uh, who, when he's in Australia, Craig, he tends to worry about climate change, mm. but he also has a part-time job in the United States, and he wrote in a publication over there calling, saying we need glass, we need a, this kind of banking separation. Um, the new Congress was sworn in two weeks ago. In a, it's, there's a new Congress sworn in every two years. The first, one of the first acts was the Glass-Steagall supporters in that Congress reintroduce the, their bill for Glass-Steagall, and it's called HR, or House Resolution 129, Here's something interesting. People see on the news about Silvio Berlusconi in Italy has put his hat in the ring. He wants to be prime minister again. Well, his party is in league with the Liga Nord or League of the North party. And their lead candidate is an old friend and admirer of Lyndon LaRouche, Giulio Tremonti, who's also the biggest champion in, in Italy for Glass-Steagall. And Liga Nord is having a fight with Berlusconi's side over who's going to be their candidate for prime minister because they want Tremonti to be that. So the biggest champion for Glass-Steagall could be the, that party's candidate for prime minister in Italy. Um, and so that, those are, they're just developments this year. Um, 
The most interesting thing, though, is there's a fight inside the Federal Reserve itself. Now, the Federal Reserve is run, is the chairman is Ben Bernanke, and he's the leader in the world for the hyperinflation policy of printing money to bail out everything, right? So this has caused a split. And the latest, just this week, is the, um, the president of the Dallas branch of the Federal Reserve, his name is Richard Fisher, he's come out calling for an end to bailouts for shadow banking, he's called it, and a banking separation. And the former, a former Fed official who's now the vice president of this Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, so his job is to try and um, uh, preserve people's deposits, he's come out demanding Glass-Steagall and getting back to the system where only real money is insured by the Fed, by this FDIC and not everything else. So this is, these are quite significant developments this year. Um, in Australia, you really think we have to get Glass-Steagall legislation into Parliament here. So that's, you know, this is now brewing around the world. The seven parliaments that we've, we can count that are around the world are looking at it. We need it here in Australia as well. Uh, Robbie, I think just to jump in there, I think the, the interesting thing is that many leaders of Australian industry and the banking system know that the entire system's in trouble. I was just reading this week about Morris Newman, for example, came out and said, Morris Newman, of course, the former head of BHP, amongst other things, uh, also, you know, he's very much part of Macquarie Bank and, and so and forth. He worked for, he worked, he was the, um, he worked for the Howard government for a while. Yeah, and the point is with him, he came out and said it wasn't possible today under any age demographic to pay back the amount of money or debt that's owed in the system. That implies that there's nothing you can do in terms of paying it back, which means it has to be dealt with. And this is what we're talking about with Glass-Steagall that a lot of the illegitimate debt that's tied up in speculation, in derivatives and all the, the, the fluff money, money that is overbearing on the economy just has to be written off. And this is the sort of legislation that we have to introduce here in this country. So Craig, we're now at the point that, given that Glass-Steagall's at that stage, we're now at the point where we actually have to start thinking about what's next. Mm. Because Glass-Steagall will not solve the problem. It's an emergency firewall that'll put a break on the collapse. The only solution, the only way to create a recovery has to be through the establishment of national banks because we've got to change the way the global financial system works so it's not a monetary system where money dictates, private money dictates to the world. It's where money is reduced to a medium of exchange which is its only place and it's um, directed under the ultimate authority of governments into the areas of the economy that create real economic growth as measured physically, right? So the CEC in 1994, because this is, this is our defining issue more than anything else, we drafted legislation. This is our 2001 book, What Australia Must Do to Survive the Depression. But we wrote legislation in 1994 for what we called the Commonwealth National Credit Bank. And you can see it on page 193 of our book. It starts to go through it there. So we'll go through it a little bit here. Um, I wanted to discuss with you the major features of this bank. This is, even though it's, not, it's universal legislation, so 1994, the timing is, is irrelevant. It's just as important now. Um, so when you read the introduction and read the, the elements of the bank, I've, I've drawn out four things that I want you to comment on and explain to the viewer. The, the, it says that, the legislation says, the Commonwealth National Credit Bank will be responsible to parliament, not private individuals. Well, Robbie, that comes out of the early discussions that I had personally with Lyndon LaRouche in the 1990s because he st we, we talked about establishing a national bank in Australia and he said to me, the problem you have in Australia, is, Craig, is that people don't understand the difference between sovereignty and autonomy. Now, what we're talking about with a national bank is a sovereign nation state accountable to no one except the general welfare of the population, the people in the Australia, having a national bank. Well, at the present time, we are seen as autonomous up to a point. And what the existing banking legislation, the Banking Act of 1959 and other legislation, makes the Governor-General able to make laws that are both consistent and inconsistent with the existing legislation when it comes to the banks. Banking. So we're not talking about having a private individual. The Reserve Bank of Australia is made up of private individuals that are independent of the government Right, so it's a private banking system that we're talking about running monetary policy. No, we're talking about, in our case, this bank is made up literally of elected officials, the Prime Minister, the Premier and Treasurer of each of the states 
and the Chief Minister of the Territories are responsible for the governance of this bank. They become the board of the bank. They become the board of the bank. So in a sense, you do away with the whole, um, you know, the meetings that take place now, the, the COAG meetings and so forth, and you put the decision-making leaders into the position of power of running the country's finances. Yep. Now, this freaks the hell out of the existing banking system, which is privately owned, because you're saying you're putting a principle, the principle of national sovereignty, ahead of the, the, the shareholder value of private corporations that run the system now, yep. particularly the, the British monarch and so forth. All right. The next, next element, the bank will invest to, quote, cause a rise in Australia's potential population density through a rise in the physical output of the nation and in the rate of introduction of new technologies into the economy. This is a physical economic measure of growth, Robbie. Most of the under monetary system, you get you get all these figures about GDP, GNP, and they're simply measurements. Which are, which are all money. financially denominated. Your gross national prostitution, I call it, because even prostitution and those such services are co uh, incorporated. You know, w what we call overheads are incorporated into the figures. No, if you go back and look at what the statistics were like back in the 1930s and 1940s from Australian Bureau of Statistics, they had detailed statistics of actual production. We've lost a lot of those statistics. They're not measured anymore because it costs too much money. So money has become the metric by which you measure an economy today, and that is why we have such a disaster in terms of not being able to measure the physical economic output. So this bank focuses its uh, uh, success on increasing that physical economic production, how much we're producing, how much we're manufacturing, how much infrastructure we're building, how local councils are going supplying the services to their local regions. Physical, not simply monetary dollar figures. Um, thirdly, the bank shall only issue credit against the tangible wealth creating capacity of the nation. Such capacity is defined as agriculture, mining and raw materials extraction, manufacturing, infrastructure, healthcare, education, and scientific research. To put it simply, Robbie, anything outside those categories is what we call overhead. Now, some of it's necessary overhead, but a lot of it is pure waste overhead. Your service industry, now, you know, back in the 30s, again, 40s, even earlier, uh, we had a substantial amount of number of people involved in actual production, manufacturing, agriculture, and so forth. Today, 60% plus of our workforce is in services. Those services are actually overheads, a lot of them. Some of them aren't, some of, the, some of them are necessary services, like for example, nurses and doctors and so forth. But a lot of them, financial services, accounting and so forth, is pure a tax on the economy. So you have to issue, you don't issue credit to have a fleet of accountants or a fleet of bankers or if, you know, provide for the offices for such things. You actually provide the credit for farmers to buy machinery, to be able to, to, to plough the ground, to, to buy properties, to develop the actual physical uh, state of the country, or for manufacturers to develop modern machinery in, a, in order to be able to produce efficiently the goods that we need. That's the difference. Yep. All right, well, that is just a s very brief overview of the, the essence of what we're proposing as an institution. People should get our book and read it. Um, and go through the legislation. But we, this is the beginning, Craig. This is 2013. We're on a big push to get this legislation passed in Parliament this year. So we're going to be talking about it a lot more. And um, so, you know, stay tuned. Watch this space. But we have to end the discussion because we've run out of time. When we come back, we're going to go through a bit of historical background, Craig will, on what happened in the 1930s on this, is, is this question of national banking. Welcome back to the CEC report. Before the bake, we were just talking about our Commonwealth National Credit Bank bill. Now, Craig, what we propose as national banking here is, is actually built upon a, quite a, a strong tradition in Australia of national banking because um, King O'Malley, the great American who came to Australia to join the Labor Party, worked tirelessly to create a national bank, the Commonwealth Bank. Um, the most dramatic chapter in the history of national banking in Australia, though, was in the Great Depression, uh, when the Labor government then had a big fight with the money power run directed by Britain over how that bank should function in the Depression. The treasurer at the time was Ted Theodore, and he led that fight. So what did Theodore do which demonstrated that he understood how a credit system worked? 
Well, just a little bit of background first, Robbie. In the 1920s, in the Great Depression, Australia was struck with very uh, high unemployment, like nearly 30%. We were also struck with the fact that a lot of our exports had died in terms of revenue coming in. And at that time, the dollar was pegged to gold. It was the gold uh, reserve. So consequently, the banks had to hold, they could have had to hold 25% of their loans, in fact, in gold. And a lot of that gold was being shipped out to pay debt. So consequently, the amount of credit in the system was dying and Shrank. wasn't shrinking and uh, shrinking and it wasn't available for lending out. So what you had was a, as a general deflation of the economy. Now at the time, the Labor Party was uh, particularly under all the great figures, uh, Anstey, in particular Theodore, uh, others, even Scullin, um, were looking at this issue of increasing the currency or the amount of credit in the system, and they approached the Commonwealth Bank to look. We want you guys to create 18 million pounds of of uh, credit to spend into the economy to increase and create actual inflation. And they called that the fiduciary note issue. Yeah, that's right. But sorry, um, you, but your point was they actually wanted to create inflation. They wanted to create inflation because, look, the, the point is that the banks and everything were contracting the credit. In other words, the, the spending power of the economy was contracting. So what do you do? Is that you increase the spending power of the people if you relax the lending conditions. They wanted the Commonwealth Bank to do that through, and it could do that. In fact, credit creation was a principal plank of the Labor Party. Everyone knew about it in the 1930s, but the Commonwealth Bank under Sir Robert Gibson says he would bloody well would not do it, and he used that sort of language, right? He was a real you know, tight sort of person in terms of the, um, uh, the monetary policy. Now, Theodore proposed a fiduciary note issue. And that the fiduciary note issue meant that you would literally print money and you would issue it against the future assets of the nation or the development of the economy in the nation. And he was proposing that 18 million pound be, be actually printed, uh, about 12 million pound was be uh, spent to support the farmers that were being crucified from the uh, from the lack of uh, money that were getting from wheat. I mean, you know, that was they were actually going to the wall. And then six million pound or so would be spent into public works to employ between 40 and 50,000 people, which would in turn spin off and employ another 40 to 50,000 people. So all that money though, whether through the farmers or to the public works, would be productive very soon. Very quickly. And it would have the effect of you know, boosting the economy. And that was the intent. Now this was poo-poo. This was shot down by the conservative uh, government that, up, that run the upper house at that particular time. And it was deemed by many afterwards that actually uh, stop that policy. That was a big mistake. The policy of deflation, the policy of the uh, the government at that point uh, was beaten. The Conservatives won. The Commonwealth Bank's policy of deflation of uh, of austerity, and from the uh, from the visit of the uh, Bank of England Chairman Nehemiah at that particular time, Otto Nehemiah won out, and Australia suffered incredibly over those years unnecessarily. And it became the subject of a, of a fierce debate because when Gibson who was essentially a bureaucrat. The, the government owned the bank. He worked for the government, and they told him to do this, and he said he wouldn't. That became a question of, that harks back to what we talked about before, of sovereignty. Who's in charge of the money system? This, this guy who, even though he's a public servant, is acting as a, as a private agent for the private banks or the government. And of course, that led to the 1936 Royal Commission on Banking. And, and what was interesting is you read back through the, the, the records in history, people then identified that that would have been the correct policy to issue that credit. Exactly. All right. Well, stay tuned for more on the history of this as well, because we're doing a lot of research on that at the moment. We'll leave it there. When we come back, we're going to talk about our other theme from recent times, the war danger and what we're doing to cause it. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Finally, Australia's concern about war with China will be the cause of it. This week, Julia Gillard, the Prime Minister, delivered her national security speech in which she proclaimed that the decade of 9-11, or the, t the war on terrorism, she didn't say the war on terrorism was over, but the, the decade defined by the war on terrorism is over. The new decade that we're in will be defined by the rise of China and the tensions that that causes. Now this is an exact 
continuation of the rhetoric that's promoting the war drive that the CEC exposed very, very thoroughly in our last two New Citizen newspapers, Craig, especially in terms of this guy, Hugh White. Because think about the formulation here. The Prime Minister said it, Hugh White says it, we don't want war with China, we want to be peaceful with China, but China's rise inevitably means it's in conflict, in competition, in conflict with the United States, and that inevitably creates tensions. I just want to jump in here, Robbie, because I've been watching a number of the commentaries on this, and everyone's poo-pooing America. But this is a British policy. This is a British geopolitical policy. It's, and if you look at our last paper, we go after Hugh White in particular, on this idea of the balance of power, right? That you have to balance out the power. There's always a winner, a loser scenario. Right? This is a British policy. Exactly. And Obama is a British pawn. And that's where the problem is coming well, from. Well, world, let me mate. back that up. Because also this week, at the start of this week, you had the Min meetings, the Australia-UK Ministerial Dialogue. And William Haig was out for it, and Britain's yeah. Defence Secretary was out for it. Haig couldn't hang around because he had to rush back because of what happened in Algeria. But the thrust of that, one of the sub-themes that's coming out of that, is the Brits are big in pushing what's coming to be known as the Asian NATO. Now, we published Malcolm Fraser's speech in our last New Citizen, Craig, because Malcolm Fraser made the point that we, we made vis-a-vis -vis Russia after the co end of the Cold War, that instead of reaching out to Russia for development, instead NATO led an encirclement of Russia and picked off Russia's neighbours with toppling their governments, etc., in order to um, expand the system that ultimately... It's the Anglo-American system which governs NATO, which is ultimately the... Wall Street City of London system. It's a global free market British... That's what the British... A global free market is a global British empire. And that's what they set out to do, and we've documented that. Well, the Asian NATO is exactly that vis-a-vis -vis China, China, and China knows it. Um, if you see on the news all these countries at the moment in conflict with China, Japan, Vietnam, the Philippines, um, Vietnam, the Philippines over these islands, etc., all these countries are the countries being targeted to be part of this Asian NATO. And of course, Australia is one of the key um, countries in it. Now, this is how serious it is. On the 23rd of January, which is just a few days ago, a Chinese colonel, Lu Mingfu, of, the, of China's National Defense University, said this, America is the global tiger and Japan is Asia's wolf and both are now madly biting China. Of all the animals, Chinese people hate the wolf the most. Right? Now, you just said the real issue is not so much America, it's Britain. Because the other thing that these guys did at Auckland, Hague, and, and, and this other, the Defence Secretary, William Hammond, did, was they prominently applauded the number one policy that has put things on edge, which is Obama's vaunted Asia pivot where Obama said, we're winding down our operations in other part of the world, we are pivoting to Asia because all about this containment policy. And the Brits are there going, yeah, 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 this is what you want to do. And so Australia is playing an abetting role to this. Mm. We, instead of us treating China in good faith on face value, we are making ourselves the basis of uh, the British and American activities that the Chinese know are targeted at them and at their sovereignty. It's pretty... An incredibly dangerous situation, Robbie. It is. But we will not stop warning about it. So, but that said, we have to stop now because we're out of time. So thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week for more of the CEC report.